Well, thanks very much, Marquise, for that uh, interesting presentation. And as you said, he'll be available if you've got some IBM follow-up questions. I think that'll be very, very interesting. Hey, well, while I got uh, just a moment to, to thank our, our sponsors for today, uh, SCI Electronics for the general session amenities, the calendars and notebooks that are, that are out in front. We're very thankful for that. For Lockheed Martin for this morning's continental breakfast and for Akima and El Sink uh, for their refreshment breaks in the exhibit halls on both sides, uh, both this morning uh, and, and this afternoon. How about a round of applause for all of our sponsors? Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll, we'll move now to our, our uh, uh, panel for this afternoon uh, entitled Modernizing Accessions. We heard uh, from this morning's panel uh, a, a very uh, provocative and informative discussion, but, but at, the, at the center of it, I think we heard from General Brown and, and others uh, that it's about people and having the right people with the right talents, skills, and abilities uh, to operationalize uh, the Army's concept. And so we'll, we we're very fortunate to have a uh, assembled a great panel for you uh, this, this afternoon. The panel is led by Dr. Casey Wardinsky, Assistant Secretary of the Army Manpower and Reserve Affairs, and I would note, a Huntsville native. All right, so welcome home, uh, Mr. Secretary. We're glad that you're back and have chosen uh, the opportunity to spend some time with us. Our moderator for this panel is Lieutenant General Retired Mick Bidnerick, uh, uh, Vice President of Contingency Operations at the Floor Government uh, Group for Floor Cooperation, uh, Corporation. Our panel members, Lieutenant General Ted Martin, Deputy Commanding General and Chief of Staff, United States Army Training and Doctrine Command. Major General Frank Muth, Commanding General, United States Army Recruiting Command. Command Sergeant Major Tim Gooden, uh, Command Sergeant Major, United States Army Training and Doctrine Command. And Brigadier uh, David Coltham, Director of Operations, Army Recruiting and Initial Training Command for the British Army. A warm welcome for our afternoon panel, please. Thank you. Nick, off to you. Nick is great. <laughs> hey, sir, uh, thanks, for, thanks for teeing this panel up for us. You know, I kind of look at the audience, and it's a hell of a lot less people here than it was this morning. I don't know, but, uh, I don't know what that means. You know, I was doing my leader's recon and setting this thing up before uh, General Ham came to, to tee up this panel for us. Came here about an hour ago. And there was about six or seven people in here. I said, well, maybe they're kind of leaning forward to this panel because of its importance. But I looked a little closer, and they're all taking a power nap. Um, and so since this is first thing after lunch, uh, hopefully for those who will kind of stay awake for this. But hey, uh, for those that are here, appreciate you joining us. Uh, we are blessed to have five distinguished senior leaders uh, that are here as, uh, General Ham kind of teed up for us, and I'm not going to go through the bios of each of, one, each of those, but we're especially thankful not only for these uh, five leaders, but also, uh, David, for you uh, coming here from our, uh, one of our most trusted allies in the, uh, in the UK and uh, teeing up for his experiences. Hey, listen, you know, what's our task and purpose for this afternoon? Uh, we've kind of read through the, uh, the agenda and kind of know what we're all about, but the Bottom line up front and in your face is the intent for this is to really have a good pointed discussion uh, on what our Army must do, what our nation uh, must do to recruit, to train, to educate, to change and adapt so we can maintain uh, the Army and the fighting force for the, uh, for the future. You know, we got a couple main points that we'll certainly kind of highlight for all of the uh, members on this panel. We'll kind of tee this up for them. but. It's all about Army accessions and taking advantage of the modern technologies that uh, everybody has read a little bit about in our, in our news. But this is not just uh, an active component or a, quote, all Army mission. Uh, this involves the total force. This involves the total Army, uh, all components, our active, our reserve teammates, certainly our guardsmen. Uh, but others as well outside of the, uh, the current Army force structure that are the influencers, if you will. And this is, as uh, many of the panel here will highlight, this is not just an Army mission, but a, a, a national mission to ensure that those that we will look to recruit, regardless of color of uniform in the future, uh, is best ready and poised to serve our nation uh, in its uh, future conflicts. Uh, then lastly, the public-private partnerships uh, across 
the uh, national security enterprise as we're kind of looking through this. Um, so we're going to tee this up for the panel, as uh, General Ham highlighted a bit ago. And the first, I'd like to turn it over to uh, the Secretary. And, and sir, thanks for joining us this, this afternoon, and appreciate your comments. Thank you very much. Uh, for the folks gathered here today, uh, you may well know that since about 2006, the Army's been talking with greater rigor and applying greater resources to the topic of talent management. Uh, talent management focused on our active component, our Reserve and National Guard, and importantly, upon our civilians. Uh, this year, you'll see that begin to unfold in important ways. Uh, but of this work we're undertaking, uh, the focus is on putting a soldier or a civilian in the right place at the right time to shape the outcomes in favor of the United States. This work will always be based on the foundation of bringing the right folks into the Army. Uh, it never gets better than we begin, and by bringing the very best that our country has to offer into our formations, we can assure we'll be up to the challenges that may lie ahead. We can apply technology and new approaches to ensure that we're bringing the right folks to our doorstep, and we can bring better assessments to, the, to bear to ensure that the right folks uh, come off that doorstep and enter our formations. I've recently uh, returned to the Army from industry, and I can tell you that in industry, and particularly the C-suites of our uh, technology firms and other enterprises, the topic of talent management is the number one concern. Today, everyone is in a competition for talent. Uh, this competition um, is unlike others, though, that the Army has faced because we face some unique challenges. Um, if we can switch to the, uh, the graphic here, uh, this graphic sort of brings forward what those challenges are. If you think back to the time of Cortez, a few key technologies changed the world, a compass and a, and a boat that could navigate the ocean. Uh, those two technologies brought the old world to the new world and forever made the world smaller. As that world became smaller, the roles of militaries evolved quickly. Uh, today, you can think of things like hypersonics, quantum computing, and a variety of new technologies that are making the world a very small place. These are unfolding at an increasing rate. That red line, uh, technology and the technological change, uh, is unfolding in an exponential pattern. Uh, when I was young, I could think of the world of yesterday, the world of today, and the world of tomorrow, and they looked a lot alike. Uh, today, young adults are growing up in a world in which they were never uh, not digital. They've always been digital. Uh, they've grown up in a world in which they're always connected, in which they always have computational uh, capacity at their fingertips. That is not the world that many of us at this table grew up in, uh, but it is a world in which they'll lead and defend their country. Uh, if you look below that, society is moving quickly, trying to keep up with technology. Facebook and the implications that had most recently in elections and the way we now think about elections and communication in the political arena as well as entertainment and other uh, spaces. Uh, below that is business. Uh, you can think of companies like Lucent, Kodak, who failed to keep up. In their space, if they fail to keep up, bankruptcy beckons, uh, resources are liberated, and new companies form. In our space, government, change takes place um, episodically. It takes place in reaction to crisis. That cannot be our condition uh, going forward. The Army and the military must find ways to evolve quickly to meet these challenges, to bring talent into our formations, uh, to put that talent in the right place at the right time, um, and to, to keep them uh, and their interests alive so they do not depart our organizations. Uh, this is the challenge we confront, and the use of technology and new methods is the topic of our pa uh, panel today to make sure the Army's well positioned to move forward. Having the right uh, soldiers uh, will allow us to uh, em engage in multi-domain operations. Uh, the literature speaks about rapidly changing capabilities and calls for the modern modernization of our doctrine. Uh, we have folks engaged in this conference who are very much focused on the modernization material, uh, but the folks gathered here at this panel today are equally focused on modernizing and bringing the best of our technologies and thought processes to bear to the process of bringing talent into the Army today and into the future. Uh, despite the demands for competition for talent across industry, 
our military model faces um, little opportunity for lateral entry. That presents another challenge to us. While the most recent uh, National Defense Authorization Acts have given us a few new tools to bring in professionals at various grades, at various ages, uh, we will continue largely to be a cohort-based organization for the foreseeable future, and therefore we must look at rising generations. Uh, I would argue that in looking at these generations, we have to begin thinking about uh, how they approach this question of where they will apply their talent. Uh, we have to confront uh, the, the choice of will we wait till they're 17 or will we begin talking to them at age 12, 13, 14, 15 when they form the set of things they are thinking about doing with their life. Uh, from the world of behavioral economics, we know if we wait, our challenge would be much more difficult. Your mom and dad's told you first impressions matter. If we wait till they're 17 or 18, we will not be the first impression. Others will have made that for us. We will be the second, third, or fourth impression. It will take much more effort to get them engaged in thinking about what we have to offer. We cannot wait. They will grow up in a very vivid world, a world of YouTube, Netflix, streaming content, game content that streams. Very engaging, very vivid. Our marketing must be up to the challenge of offsetting that vivid content. Very few young adults have ever seen an American fighter aircraft downed by enemy action. I don't think since 35 we've had one. Uh, for 35 years we've had one. They very few have seen an American warship damaged by enemy action. But they've grown in a world of vivid information about the challenges soldiers confront, and that skews their thinking about the life of a soldier and uh, Army activities on the battlefield. It's up to us to bring the right technologies to bear, to give them a balanced picture, to provide that picture early enough to shape their thinking and ensure we are a first choice and not the choice that occurs after all other choices have failed to materialize for young adults. Thank you. Hey, sir, th thanks, for, uh, thanks for that intro. Hey, just as a reminder to everybody, we'll passing out, similar to what we did for this morning's panel, we'll pass out some five by eight cards to scribble down some questions. Uh, so be thinking about those and give you an opportunity to engage the, uh, engage the panel when we open it up for, uh, for q and I'd like to turn it uh, over now to uh, General Ted Martin. Sir, over to you, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, first off, I'm very excited to be here to talk to you about TRADOC, Training and Doctrine Command's efforts uh, in the accessions arena. Specifically, uh, today we'll be talking about recruiting. Uh, I can't tell you, uh, having come back to TRADOC after about 35 years, uh, from my first touch point and, uh, you know, wrapping my arms around uh, the recruiting mission, it was a, an eye-opener. I used to think the most uh, dangerous high-risk job in the Army was to be General Odierno's Division Cavalry Squadron Commander, <laughs> uh, and I rapidly found out that uh, the re where the rubber meets the road in the recruiting arena at the recruiting station uh, to be a recruiter in Frank Moose Recruiting Command is uh, not only high adventure, it's high stress, and it's also uh, very re rewarding. But we have to be honest here, uh, last year at the end of FY18, we came up short and we're not happy about that. Uh, like any military unit that, uh, you know, doesn't come out on the uh, victory end of a, of a particular engagement, uh, the first thing we said was, there are probably a lot of reasons this happened, but the most important thing we need to remember is there's really no excuse. Uh, so we really uh, dove in on this uh, problem set. Uh, but one thing we did not do, as the end of the year closed out, we did not sacrifice quality for quantity. The Army senior leadership held the line, and uh, although the DOD uh, allows us to recruit up to 4% of the lowest category, uh, we, we held the line at 2%. 1.93. 1.93, as Frank reminds me. And that's because we know that the most important thing we can do is put the right soldiers into those boots and get them out into the field. Uh, so we're very proud of that. But we took this opportunity to, give a, uh, to do a holistic, introspective look at our entire accessions enterprise. Uh, and we were empowered by the Army senior leadership, which uh, placed uh, General Townsend, my commanding general, uh, at, the, at the head of that uh, effort. Uh, so we did a very in-depth uh, after-action review, and one of the first things we discovered was our organization for combat and the way we were approaching uh, authorities 
uh, if you will, mission command in this arena was, was not optimal. In fact, uh, I often say that if Napoleon came in and looked at how we were doing business, he would have slapped many of us. Uh, and so one of the first things that happened was General Townsend was designated by uh, the Secretary and the Chief as a senior responsible officer uh, for accessions. And what that did is uh, allowed him to lead this uh, holistic review and to develop a strategy uh, that was briefed to and approved by Army senior leaders. That strategy, uh, uh, one of the byproducts was a campaign plan that Frank's going to discuss in a little bit more detail. Uh, but, you know, when we talk about the senior responsible officer's duties, roles, and responsibilities, we can break this mission command down into two particular areas. First is the practice, and then is the systems. And uh, maybe systems first is most important. We look down, and uh, the tools that our recruiters were, were using were, are on their last legs. They have not had a technology refresh in over a decade. Uh, so imagine a computing system designed 10 to 15 years ago trying to compete in today's market. So the, uh, the standing system was the Army Recruiting Information Support System, commonly referred to as ARIS. We are currently uh, under the uh, leadership of the Deputy Undersecretary of the Army, uh, rapidly closing in on the new system, which is called the Accessions Information Enterprise. It will be based off a commercial off-the-shelf system, uh, tooled and tailored uh, to the requirements of the United States Army, and it's uh, just like the efforts that Army Futures Command is undergoing. It's got the same amount of emphasis and is given, being given those same resources. As you heard the Undersecretary say earlier today, they, the Army had to make choices and investments, and they are investing heavily into the accessions arena. So we're very happy about that. From the, from the, from the practice, I would tell you that uh, as we looked at the environment that recruiters were operating in, it became clear that uh, we needed to have more freedoms and these are informed freedoms. For example, we know that the young men and women that we would like to uh, invite to serve in our army uh, re reside on, the social, on social media. And our tools to access or gain access uh, to those young men and women was extremely restricted. Virtual recruiting teams have been established at the battalion level, but they were very uh, underfunded and the restrictions that were placed on them were arduous. Uh, for example, Recruiters could not have social media applications on their government phones. All of that changed in the blink of an eye. So now recruiters are able to uh, gain and maintain contact with prospects on typical social media where the, where the kids, I'm sorry, where the young men and women reside. Uh, additionally, we took a look at uh, the face of the Army that, that resides in the digital arena, GoArmy.com. GoArmy.com had gone over a decade without a major refresh and we found that uh, we were lagging uh, in this arena. So GoArmy.com has had a, a quick uh, refresh, uh, which Frank can talk to you a little bit more about that, uh, but we are now going all in to get a modern uh, face of the Army on the digital uh, market. So expect to see GoArmy.com take off shortly. It's already made two incremental jumps right now, and we know that it's uh, moving in the right direction. So I mentioned the campaign plan, and just uh, generally, without going through the hundreds of pages of uh, minute uh, details, uh, one thing we noticed as we looked across America is that we were underperforming in 22 key market areas. So uh, the Army uh, was being underrepresented in the whole in these 22 particular cities. So the Army senior leadership came all in on supporting our recruiting uh, efforts in those 22 cities. What we found was uh, everybody wanted to help from the top, from the secretary and the chief, all the way down to uh, local uh, force comm and trade -oc units that were available to help recruiters out. So we found that we needed to use a fusion approach to focus those efforts and to get, get effects in those 22 uh, particular cities, and not just those 22 cities, but those are areas that we uh, gave specific attention to. To be honest with you, I'm a believer in the product. My son is a soldier. My daughter-in-law will commission this summer. Uh, so it, it just struck me as odd that uh, more young men and women weren't interested in uh, 
uh, military service and service in the United States Army in particular. So I was very excited to see this uh, outreach program. Uh, in fact, uh, right now, the third iteration of the, Ar of the Army's fusion approach to accessions is taking place at uh, Fort Eustis, Virginia, and will close out on Wednesday. The last thing I'll talk about is the positive inspired leadership. From the top, the uh, secretary and the chief, all the way down uh, to the recruiting stations, there's a new attitude in recruiting. There's a new positive uh, approach to this recruiting mission. It's exciting, and uh, I can guarantee you that uh, on October 1st, uh, 2019, we will close out at 68,000 soldiers in boots as directed. Frank, off to you. Thank you, yeah, sir. No, I think, thanks, Ted. And, and I tell you, you know, that's, uh, it highlights what the uh, senior leadership, not only of our Army, but uh, the Secretary has uh, prioritized and put the emphasis on that, as you highlighted, Ted, with a shortfall of this past year, but uh, on the right glide path for the, for the future. Uh, General Frank Muth, who's, the, of course, the commander of the United States Army Recruiting <laughs> Command, got a lot of details in the day-to-day -day activity. So, Frank, over to you, sir. Thanks. Thank you, sir. And thank you again for inviting myself. And uh, we brought a couple of the teammates here. And it's a great opportunity to talk about recruiting and talk about all the recruiters that are out there, the 10,000 recruiters at 1,400 locations. And I know this panel is about technology and how we leverage technology to recruit and how we've changed by looking at ourselves very closely this past summer. But let me give you some numbers that haven't changed. And they haven't changed, and we have historic data that supports that since 1974. If we're going to recruit 85,000, we have to look eyeball to eyeball with 14 million. Out of 14 million, 500,000 agree to do an interview. But only 400,000 actually show up. Out of that 400,000, 250,000 agree to test. Out of that 250,000, only 150,000 actually pass the test. All right, And then out of that, you actually get 85,000 that will contract, and 75,000 will actually assess that year, and we hold another, the, the, the 10,000 that didn't assess for the next year, because we always have to have a debt pool going into the next year. That's how you get 75,000 people to assess, by talking to 14 million. Now, when we came together uh, as a team this past summer, uh, you know, any good organization when something happens is gonna look very hard at itself. And the first thing we did is we looked internally and we started talking with the recruiters. Because who else better knows than the recruiters that are down in the trenches every day? And the first thing they brought up was technology and leveraging technology to enable them to get after that 14 million eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball contacts in a more uh, efficient manner. So what did we do? The first thing we did is uh, I was approached by a group from uh, one of the recruiting stations in Baton Rouge. And they said, you know, we've been, uh, some of us have been doing this e-gaming thing for a while. And I go, okay, what's that? Of course, I had to call my son to find out, what are, they guys, what are they talking about? He says, Dad, it's Fortnite. It's really popular. I'm like, okay, explain this thing to me. So he gave me a tutorial on it, and I say, okay, I understand it. We did a test uh, in recruiting out of L.A. with this same group, the recruiters, and through a hashtag that was directly linked to one of our recruiters, we had 35,000 sign up before we went live for a tournament in Ultimate Fighter on Twitch, which is a very popular uh, digital streaming network that a lot of the gamers use. And we thought, that's pretty good, because we were watching it live. Uh, within five minutes of it going live, 1.1 million had logged on to watch our recruiter, who was in a uniform, and he was actually calling a fight in Ultimate Fighter. And uh, he talked about being a recruiter, more than 150 jobs in the Army, so on and so forth. I've got recruiters standing by, goarmy.com, this, that, and the other. Uh, and that, and then within 24 hours, 2.4 million people went back and watched it because some of them people don't watch live. The heat map showed that because we had all the ROI in the heat map. That was in LA. People were watching it from Alaska all the way down the west coast out to the uh, southwest, uh, pretty much stopped in the El Paso area. We had all that data, and that just started with an e-gaming tournament, one and a small one at that. So we looked hard and we said, how can we get after the Z generation? The Z generation that are on the digital network right now, and if you talk to any of your children, they are all gaming out there. Twitch, like I talked about, the digital network, gets 150 million views a month, and it's growing. It's the most rapidly growing uh, uh, popular or process, or not process, but social uh, engagement that is occurring in the Z generation right now, and it's going through the roof. So we said, how can we get involved in this? So we went out in the Army and we offered up anybody that wanted to come out for our team, they could. 
8,000 soldiers out of our force signed up to do tryouts, and we picked 20. And those 20 folks are right now, they're, they're moving their way to Fort Knox, uh, but they're still participating in tournaments, and we have one at Boston this weekend. They're gonna be in Ultimate Fighter, uh, Apex, Fortnite, several of the other games. And there will be 80,000 people within the age of 17 to 24, the Z-Gen, that will be coming to the convention and well over 20 million that will be logging in to watch the tournament from all parts of the United States. And our team, uh, they're, gonna, they're part of the recruiting force. They're going to go through the three-day recruiting uh, intensive course. And they're out there to one game to win and also engage with the Z generation to give them the knowledge about serving in our military and, uh, and what it means to, and the opportunities in the military. So that's the first part of our technology. The next part, General uh, Martin talked about the virtual recruiting teams. It was a test pilot when we first came on board. We fully activated it in the summer, and it's a three-person team that does nothing but what we call prospecting and lead generation. Because the top of the funnel of the science of recruiting, which ends up with a contract at the end, starts with you prospecting for applicants and getting a lead and making a, an appointment. And these guys go on and gals go on the digital network and boost on Facebook, boost on Instagram, boost on Google, do everything they can to push out the message and get leads to, and generate leads and send them right down to the recruiters, to the zip code, and they follow up and get them in there. That's a three-person team. We have tracked the data and the ROI on that, and we have out of uh, the top five battalions right now, Houston, Harrisburg, North Cal, um, uh, uh, New York um, and also Kansas City put in well over just this three-person team 100 applicants contracts for the first quarter. That is, that's an amazing amount from three people on the digital network. And then lastly, we have now started to, uh, we've talked to the Army Gaming Studio that is going to uh, develop a app for us to allow for applicants to do a uh, kind of a test and, and do practice tests uh, on the ASVAB, but on a mobile device, because we're also finding that a lot of the youth today, they don't have access to laptops anymore or to desktops. They're, everything's on the mobile advice, um, mobile, and we have some practices on the laptops and desktops, but not mobile. So that the recruiters are asking for this capability to allow for folks to kind of work on their ability to get a higher score in the ASVAB. Again, more to talk about uh, in the question and answer, because we're doing a lot more. We probably, since the summer, have 20 different initiatives of changing how we recruit, modernizing the recruiting process, and taking it from an analog to a digital age to ensure that at the end of the day, and our numbers say right now, we'll actually be at 68,104 by the 1st of October. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Hey, Frank, thanks. I mean, a lot of... Uh... I know some of the audience kind of looking, even those that are up there in the $1 section, uh, kind of scribbling down some of your, uh, some of your statistics there. Uh, you'll probably get some questions generated with that. Hey, I mentioned up front we're uh, extra blessed this afternoon to have uh, Brigadier uh, David Coltham with us. He's the Director of Operations uh, in the British Army, responsible for recruiting and uh, initial uh, training uh, command. So. David, over to you, sir. Thank you. General, thank you very much. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for having me here. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I look forward to the debate to follow. I think uh, it would be helpful if I just gave you a bit of context. I've got a few slides and a short video clip to run through just to explain what it is the British Army is doing in this space. You'll see there's a lot of similarities, but obviously some differences too. So in terms of con context, the British Army contractorized much, but not all of our recruiting operation to a uh, commercial partner um, seven years ago on a 10-year contract, so we have three more years to go. The Army is currently undermanned in a regular component, active component by about 5,000 uh, soldiers, and recruiting targets have not been met uh, for year on year. You can see, next slide please, you can see here that the trends that we see are probably similar to ones that you see here. Uh, unemployed rate uh, reducing, employment rising, um, We've got uh, a demographic trough with uh, ethnic minority becoming more of a challenging space than it is in the, in the past, and a declining audience. 7%, we estimate from research, of our target audience don't know or know someone who has served or is serving. There's a large proportion, therefore, that don't. So how do we make the army more attainable for those who may or may not even have thought that they aspire to service? 
to feel that they would fit in, particularly in the age group we're after, uh, and that, uh, to remove some of that trepidation. Next, please. So starting in uh, late 2016, we kicked off a campaign that's still rolling <coughs> forward in its third year now called Belonging, to drag the benefit from an emotional connection through to something that is attainable, to remove the myths, dispuffs, uh, bust some of the stereotypes. Next. And this is what we found, that actually soldiers who serve for that sense of belonging, of being together, that common purpose is really, really important. We sort of knew it, but we're probing glossing over it and focusing elsewhere in our campaigns to attract people. Next. Summed up well, I think, in this overarching proposition you can see here, that belonging to something that is bigger than you, but that will accept you for you, was really resonating with the target audience that we we're trying to appeal to. So, next. Starting in the January of each year in the last three years, uh, we've kicked off a new campaign under that banner of belonging. The first one, two years ago, uh, was about finding a place in the army, something that you could belong to. Um, starting that emotional connection, if you like. Next. Last year, it was about making that thing attainable. It was bringing in some more emotional aspects to it, making it reaching out to those individuals and communities that might not have associated with the army. It was, at the time, quite controversial. Next. And this year, we've strung the last two years together and built upon them so that because of belonging, someone like me, someone like them, can do something that really matters. And that theme has carried through. And the next couple of minutes film clip explains to you the marketing strategy that the British Army is currently following. Film, please. Joining the Army is a decision to change your life. Motivating such a big decision has become harder. The employment market is more competitive people are less likely to know anyone in the army or even know what the army do these days. It's time to reassert what belonging in the army can offer this generation. Our audience are ambitious and seek purpose. But the jobs on offer don't fulfill that need. Many young people feel trapped in unrewarding jobs. We have a chance to show it's not like that in the Army. The new campaign shows how, in the Army, everyone does something that really matters. To them, to others, to the country, to the world. The campaign shows the audience how their potential will be valued, where others may dismiss them. Summed up in our core campaign message. Influencer and audience engagement will kick the campaign off giving the audience themselves a voice. Two films will speak to misrepresented young people today and influencers will respond to negative stereotypes. Attention-grabbing posters will challenge stereotypes and show how the army spots young people's potential. Supported by a wider PR programme, engaging gatekeepers and the media, as well as a coverage in Locker magazine. TV adverts showcase a wider range of important work the Army are doing around the world, which this generation's potential is needed to do. Radio adverts paint a picture of young people which the listener themselves may judge, before showing the positive the Army spots and important work it's needed for. Social and digital content, including a partnership with Unilad, continue the campaign telling deeper stories of how the audience's potential is used to do something that matters. Online digital banners deliver further messages about specific army benefits, making the campaign more tailored the closer people get to application. Below the line activity supports conversion and deliver targeted content for specific roles to fill, like TLGs, junior entry, apprenticeships and officers. Later in the campaign, after registering on the website, Bespoke, personalised, dynamic videos will make candidates feel needed and wanted from day one, inspiring them about army life and supporting them in finding where they belong. This generation have been stereotyped and shortchanged with a lack of meaningful jobs. 
This year, we'll show how they can belong to a team that values their potential and use it for something that really matters. Your army needs you. Next slide, please. So, how is it doing? Uh, this uh, slide here shows you that if you uh, remove that blue block on the top of the 16, 17 year, which is an anomaly for a reason I can't, I won't bore you with right now, you can see that the applications to join the army as a regular soldier are on a rising trend as a consequence of that campaign. Much to the dismay, I have to say, of many dissenters out there, uh, members of the public, media, veterans, who say this is no way to recruit for the army. Uh, the number of applications would, would suggest that they're slightly different. Um, hopefully that's some food for thought for some questions that will follow. Next, thank you. Hey, um, David, thanks for that. Okay, so truth in lending. Um, David and I had a bet that he would not be able to get through 10 slides in a two and a half minute video in seven minutes, so I owe you push-ups. That's uh, <laughs> good, good for that. Hey, um, we always save the, uh, the best for last, and uh, Command Sergeant Major uh, Tim Gooden does not need any introduction. He and I got a lot of rucksack time from prior lifetime, but Sergeant Major, thanks for uh, being with us this afternoon and appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us. Thanks. Yes, sir, thanks. Um, not to disappoint anybody, but uh, I won't be talking about a whole lot of technology on my piece. Um, <laughs> I will, I will acknowledge, though, that uh, those things are all extremely important, and uh, uh, as, as, been, as has been discussed uh, so far with modernizing our sessions and acquiring talent and connecting with our current generation, which, again, all of these things are very important in enabling us to get the right recruit. And in getting the right recruit uh, with their health assessments and uh, their citizenship checks and academic related measurements along with uh, what we provide as an initial physical assessment better known as the OPAT. Uh, we can place them based on their talents where they best will serve in the Army. Uh, I concur that uh, we must dominate the virtual domain uh, as it is the youth of our nation uh, play video games uh, and so does a good majority of our adults in our nation, uh, but based off of that virtual experience, uh, it's easy for them to relate, uh, and then we can turn that, that virtual experience into real life experience after they join the Army. But in getting a good balance of those attributes that a recruit needs that we require from recruits, we also have to dominate in the physical domain, and also in the non-cognitive domain. Getting, getting those things uh, that are not always easy, easily seen from our uh, applicants is, uh, is a challenge. And quite honestly, I think that some of those things that uh, we need them to be able to do to not necessarily dominate being physical, but to be able to display that and show that they can move on to the next thing a lot of those they're only going to be able to display for us after we've put them through trials and, and tests and stressors. And a lot of that comes in the form of uh, a continuation of our sessions uh, plan in, in the initial entry training realm. Uh, and it's important for us to be able to do that as we transform uh, citizen volunteers into soldiers, uh, turn them into soldiers that uh, really is is a, is a different doorway that they're stepping into than, uh, than I did, and many of us up here on the panel, and many of you in the audience, as we, uh, as we consider multi-domain operations and near-peer threats, <clears throat> living in uh, austere environments, being expeditionary, uh, not having the central location of a deployed uh, in-theater operation base, if you want to call it, uh, and not knowing what any of these things are and not knowing where they're going to be placed at in uh, the next days. So all of that is important. Uh, and as a continuation of our accessions process, it is important that our initial entry training uh, is and remains, and we continue to look at it as a good way to assess uh, the grit 
that we need for the heart and the mind of what our soldiers are required to do. Thanks. I look forward to your questions. Hey, Sergeant Major, thanks. Uh, so we're going to get an opportunity to open up for, uh, for Q&A. Uh, most of the audience kind of looking from my, uh, from my cupola up here is, is still awake. Some people that Sandman is uh, beating you about the head and shoulders, I can tell. Um, but hey, the first question, Sergeant Major, goes right to you. And you kind of talked about from the, the framework of recruiting across our, uh, across our army, across our nation. Uh, but here's uh, somewhat of a foxhole question. So, Sergeant Major, the first one is, what are we hearing on the implications for the new uh, ACFT on recruiting? Uh, and although the uh, new combat fitness test, uh, not 100% uh, locked down, still got work yet to do, but Sergeant Major, tee that up for you first, and then Frank, I, I'm, I know you'll have a couple comments as well. Sergeant Major? Yes, sir, thanks. Um, so not to belabor this too much, as a matter of fact, I just uh, talked to uh, uh, an NCO panel uh, during lunch, uh, brown bag lunch ses session, and uh, I gave them a quick update on uh, some of the things that are happening with the ACFT. And we're in mid-swing right now uh, uh, this month, March and April, of testing the 63 test battalions on their, uh, if you want to call it, diagnostic ACFT. Uh, and and the way that a lot of folks are, the feedback that we're getting is, you know, test scores are, are okay. Uh, there's a lot of, there was, and there probably still is, a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth and wringing of hands. Um, but I will tell you that uh, as you introduce these new standards and as you uh, educate folks on the new standards and train them to those new standards, um, and, and this is not surprising, however, a lot of people are surprised about it, we will rise to the challenge. Uh, and we will implement the same thing uh, in across our uh, IET environment uh, to include uh, in, in, in the sessions with recruiting. I uh, will continue to uh, use the OPAT, and I don't want to steal any of General Muth's uh, thunder, but we'll continue to use the OPAT to assess the three categories uh, that equate to uh, MOS selection, uh, and, we, and we will uh, transform that straight into the initial entry training uh, base when, it, when they start basic training or OSET, uh, and it'll be straight into AIT, um, and again, you know, uh, we have, uh, uh, unfortunately, I think this is kind of like the dynamic that's been built over the last 15 years, but we have a, uh, uh, we have a, a base uh, of soldiers uh, in our Army that, uh, regardless of gender, grade, or anything else, or time in service, that uh, they're, they're content with meeting the minimal standards. As long as they pass a the standard, they're okay with meeting the minimal standards. Uh, I see it in all different areas and aspects of the Army as I, as I go through and see things, not just in this job, but in some of my former jobs. Um, and that is disheartening. Uh, um, but, you know, as we, as we introduce the ACFT and kind of change the dynamic and the culture and, and the thought process on fitness and the, <clears throat> and the whole piece on hol holistic health, uh, and we increase that standard, uh, I am confident that uh, our soldiers will rise to that challenge and meet that standard. Uh, and again, it's, it's kind of like one of those part of the non-cognitive pieces that I was just talking about. It's, I mean, yes, we can test them with the OPAT uh, as they're an applicant going through the uh, sessions uh, screening process. Um, and, and then when they get into uh, IET, they may not do well on their first uh, PT test. Uh, I think back many years ago, and I know I didn't do very well on my first APFT, um, but I wasn't settling for that. And I had coaches that were pushing me to do better uh, in the form of drill sergeants. And uh, uh, again, I'm confident that uh, introducing something new like this will uh, continue to uh, set our, our future soldiers, the next generation, up for success. Thanks. Yes, our major thanks, and, and Frank, you and I talked a little bit about this uh, yeah. ahead of time. I'm going to turn this over to you for a couple of comments. But a lot of the things that all of us are here in my dialogue with some senior enlisted leaders uh, who are responsible for the resources to tee up the uh, the new combat fitness test of equipment, of space, active guard, reserve across multiple post camps and stations. Do they have the facilities that they need? And 
Uh, Frank, you were pretty confident that as we work through this, uh, we'll be able to get there. Frank, over yes, sir. You. No, it, right, uh, just like Sergeant Major mentioned, the uh, Command Sergeant Major mentioned that uh, we already do the operational or the op, uh, occupational uh, physical assessment test before they come into the, uh, uh, to determine what MOS they're going to go into uh, and what they're qualified for. But, you know, this was, we talked about this a little bit before as a group, and I, this was, I, I have no analytics to back this up, but, you know, I'm a big CrossFitter uh, and, and, and high intensity interval training. Uh, I've taken uh, the ACFT. And, I'll, and you're right, it's challenging. But just like the Sergeant Major said, what I see already out when I go visit the different posts and all the different areas in the Army, uh, people are starting to do PT differently. They're starting to train differently. Because you can't just go out and do a three-mile run and think you're going to go past this test. Uh, whether it's going to be the, the sled drag uh, or whether it's going to be you know, the, the, their, their pull-ups or the, I think, the knee-up. Uh, uh, pardon me? Leg tucks. Leg tucks. I did it. I just don't remember the name of it. But uh, I will tell you that uh, it's challenging. But, it, but we know this. It's been proven. You've got to do strength training. You've got to do all these different types of training, one, to prevent injuries uh, and ultimately prepare yourself for combat and the, and the stresses of combat. So I just noticed people have already started to change how they're looking at both doing physical training every morning and how they're viewing instead of just trying to gear up a month before the PT test. You have to stay in shape all the time. Yeah, no, Frank, uh, th th thanks. Uh, Mr. Secretary, we got a, a somewhat in your, uh, in your sandbox on the policy stuff in, uh, in uh, MNRA. So, you know, earlier we had the discussion and the comments from uh, that uh, General Martin had made kind of laid out. But what else is being emphasized at the Army policy level? Uh, how do we predict it? How do we measure it? And from your perspective and purview, the lessons learned and, and uh, coordinating across the total force, uh, active guard and reserve, sir. Sure. So um, I'd say we're at the, probably the third crossroad in the period of the all volunteer force. The first was about 1980, uh, the Be All You Can Be Army. The second was probably about 1999, the Army had missed its recruiting mission for the second year in a row. And uh, this year, uh, obviously, we've charted a different course for the Army and a much a uh, more vigorous approach to recruiting. Uh, General Moose uh, laid that out in excellent detail, I thought, with regard to technology and the approaches we're taking to uh, being in spaces that young adults uh, are active in and helping shape their thinking about the Army in those spaces. Um, when we think about the Guard, uh, Reserve, and Active Force, uh, this year the Army is responsible for recruiting for all three. Uh, it used to be the Guard had their own marketing campaign, their own resources, and so forth. And uh, based on the most recent Authorization Act, the Army now uh, has purview over all of that. Uh, that's a good thing, uh, because we're also taking a new look at the way soldiers move between those components um, and, and with regard to talent management. So it used to be pretty laborious to move a soldier from one component to the other, as the Army and the nation had need of their services. Uh, so it's highly appropriate that we, when we talk to America about being a soldier, we're able to array all those choices uh, to folks. Uh, when they're confronting uh, whether they'd like to be active, um, work at the state level in a lot of things that are related to emergencies and disaster relief, as well as uh, full-up combat operations and then the reserve. Um, under, under the hood of all that is a talent management system designed to take advantage of that all the way into our surveying component. Huntsville's obviously a, a town in which Army surveying employees are key uh, players in modernizing our force. Uh, you only have to go to the arsenal to see uh, the wonderful work they do. So when we think about uh, the Army, we do think civilian, guard, reserve, active, and all the things we need to do in policy to allow people to move back and forth between those elements. Uh, in a modern age, I can picture folks in cyber moving readily between those, um, depending on where we need them. Battlefield, probably active. Uh, here at the arsenal, perhaps civilian. Uh, law enforcement, perhaps National Guard. Uh, so those sorts of things are going on in real time now in the Army, thinking about those as a total Army effort, not just active uh, Guard or Reserve, but all the components together um, to make sure we're leveraging uh, all the resources that we can bring to bear uh, because the challenges coming at us will necessitate that. Uh, the, the peers we confront today will bring resources uh, to their first blow against freedom uh, that we uh, normally would have relied on an ally to take that first blow while we mustered our strength and resources, uh, which were going to be uh, superior to theirs. Uh, next time around, we may take the first blow, and their resources, other than uh, in the human domain, may be superior to ours. 
Yes, yeah, sir, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Secretary, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Um, Brigadier, a good uh, question for you, and as I kind of read through this one, uh, Frank, I think you'll uh, attack this one, attack this one as well. Uh, the question is, many recruits um, join because of soldiers or former soldiers that they know that are currently serving, and how we treat those who leave the ranks, in fact, shapes those who join the ranks. Uh, Brigadier, could you comment on how you coordinate between the recruiting for your active forces and then support to those who leave the force? Uh, I'll give it a go. Um, there, is, there is a close relationship between the two, and it's interesting that uh, I mentioned um, in my short introduction that there, is, there was some controversy earlier on in the uh, belonging campaign at the beginning of this year too, when we started uh, this year's round, uh, where because we've taken a different tack, we've been appealing to the new generation, the back end of the millennial generation, the start of Generation Z, that it's a more of an emotional connection that is what we're trying to achieve. The numbers seem to have responded well in that sense, but the veteran community have, have not responded as well. And many of them have uh, been openly critical on social media, many have been openly critical in the press and the media uh, that this is not the way to recruit for the future. Interesting that the numbers don't reflect that, that, that actually there is some connection there about how you appeal to the new generation today. So this relationship that exists between those who've served and those who have yet to serve is a really important one. And I think we learned a lot from what we didn't quite get right in January 18, that we hadn't really briefed the serving community, we hadn't properly explained to the veteran community what it was we were trying to do to get new people into the army. And, and they became a dementor against what we were trying to achieve. So this year we took a different tack. And before we went noisy in a public forum and said this is what we're trying to do, and launched the advertisements that were linked to the strategy film that you've just seen, uh, was try and better explain what we're doing to, to those people who are serving and have served. And I think whilst it was still controversial, many of which, much of which was designed to be, to, to generate debate, to get people talking about it, um, we got much less pushback from our veteran community this time around. Of course, serving uh, is um, all about, you know, starting in the army as well as being retained. So we are struggling uh, with a personnel campaign which uh, the SRO for recruiting is running for, for the Army. A personnel campaign. There's a campaign plan with eight lines of operation holding lots of different general officers to account. Uh, and one tenet of that is retaining the people that we've got. Uh, manning the Army fully is, is obviously not just about putting lots in at the front end. You've got to retain the ones you have for as long as you possibly have. So. Um, and that, that's a multifaceted operation in itself. The lived experience, as we refer to it, how good the quality of life is for those who are serving, um, is um, something that we strive to do more about, making better, about those opportunities that soldiers and officers who join want to achieve, to ensure that, at the very least, we're retaining them, but when they do leave, they leave with a positive experience that isn't gonna have uh, a negative consequence amongst those we're trying to attract. And when you go back to think about those, the, the, the very small percentages that actually know someone who's served, when they do bump into someone who has served or is serving, you want those that you're about to recruit to, to be a positive experience to, for, for your soldiers and officers and the veterans to be a role models, to, uh, to be exemplars of what it is you're trying to, to, to get into the army. So the, the relationship is a really close one, I think. We didn't do it well enough yet, I don't think. Yeah, David, thanks. And Frank, I'm not going to allow you to jump on that one. I've got another question for you. Okay. Um, this is a, another good one having to do with the active uh, recruiting campaign. So the question uh, to General Muth, how is the Warriors Wanted campaign doing? And, and doesn't this approach of Warriors Wanted doesn't that minimize the multitude of other opportunities uh, across our Army? Uh, so first of all, the Warriors wanted, I'm sure everybody's seen it, uh, there were four separate commercials that came out starting in the uh, September timeframe. Uh, they were, they were very, uh, Warriors kind of wanted, uh, you know, 
are, are you up to the task? Are you up to the challenge? Um, and talking to our recruiters, you know, a lot of the uh, recruiters will tell you out of places like Chicago, Baltimore, New York, uh, Boston, they don't resonate in the cities. Uh, and what which resonates there is more your science, technology, engineer, math, your STEM-related commercials. But I will tell you overall, the Warriors campaign, and I, I, I need to let AMRG to get into the analytics, but both the impressions, uh, the, the uplift in, in contracts and our sessions overall, not just along the lines of the commercials that you saw, uh, but also several other initiatives that took place uh, uh, through the fall, starting in the fall, really, and through and, and still going on to today. Uh, I will say that as we transition from marketing firms, uh, which is occurring right now, uh, the intent is to add more STEM uh, type of commercials. Uh, remember, we have over 150 different MOSs in the Army, and we want to include a lot of that. I personally want to include, because you saw that on the, uh, the UK video, which I thought was great, I, if I can advocate, I haven't seen a, uh, a commercial that had a soldier in civilian clothes, I think since like 1979, because we never show soldiers went off duty and we never show soldiers having families. And I'll tell you, some of the misperceptions amongst the Z generation are, uh, can we own a dog? Are we allowed to own a car? Um, do we always live in the barracks? Am I allowed to get married? Can I have children? And we don't necessarily convey that, and so we need to start doing more of that. Um, if, lastly, I'll finish with this, is what you see on the national level, is that was a, that's a great campaign to start us off the year, and of course we're gonna um, take this through the end of the year with some newer commercials, I'm sure. <coughs> what we are making commercials that are on the digital realm, more on the YouTube, more on Instagram, more on uh, Facebook at the USEREC level. And we just finished two of them, and we have four more in the hopper. And they, they, you know, they take us about a month, uh, but if I could, uh, this is called, four, I wanted to call it Soldier's Journey, but they convinced me it's uh, more in four, more in four. And it shows, uh, it starts with, uh, and these are multiple ways that we can change the MOS, the race, and the gender, and um, you know, uh, how they're doing it, but the, the theme is the same. And it starts with uh, a young applicant graduating from high school, showing them in their cap and gown. The next, they go to their training, and the MOS training, which it, we're doing very STEM-related. Uh, they're, the, they're in the classroom on computers. The next, they're applying it to their MOS out in the Army. The next is they're being farewelled in the Army. They're getting their plaque, their award, getting hugs from their warrior buddies. The next, they are volunteering in their community. So this one has them either at a food bank or coaching a basketball team. And the last is they're walking up the steps into college with a backpack with the emblem GoArmy.com on the back. So we are, we are doing that across the board. And you may see it on YouTube, you may not, but we think that's getting after really, if you think about it, that what you saw on the national level, you saw on TV at the NFL and everything, but those 18 to 24 year olds, they're on the digital network and that's where we're kind of focusing our, more of our STEM related commercials. Yeah, no, Frank, thanks. Uh, hey, uh, General Martin, sir, uh, this next one is uh, directed into your sandbox. You know, we've, so far, everybody here, we, we've all been talking about, uh, quote, modernizing accessions for our enlisted force warriors. Uh, but following the recent holistic review across our Army, what, what changes can we potentially look for, expect on the flexibility of officers uh, to serve outside of traditional career timelines uh, to include more uh, direct commissions, et cetera. Any thoughts, sir? Uh, well, I'll tell you how I'd approach the question. Uh, so from, from an accessions uh, arena, one, one of the byproducts of the holistic review was uh, linking uh, enlisted opportunities, officer opportunities, and then also linking uh, establishing a linkage between West Point and Reserve Officer uh, ROTC. ROTC, Reserve Officers, uh, you know, in the 270 colleges uh, that we're uh, resident in right now. Actually, it's over 900 uh, counting satellites. Uh, so there's been a fusion of effort. Uh, Frank, uh, his recruiters are linked with the professors of military science at the various uh, colleges and universities that are out there. So we see some people start off on the path, uh, on, the, on the way to being an officer, and it doesn't necessarily work out as originally planned. There are other opportunities 
to serve and then return uh, to college, as, as Frank said. Additionally, uh, as West Point uh, shares uh, application information with ROTC, we offer additional opportunities to those young men and women that aspire to be an officer. So that's the biggest change I've seen. I don't, Frank, uh, your, your feelings on how well uh, recruiters down in the college have been going. It's actually working quite well. Uh, so uh, you get, by the end of the semester, you get the stop out list and we're standing right there and they stop out for two reasons, academics or financial. And we're able to backstop both of those because whether it's academics, then you can, you know, because we provide the opportunity for maturity, focus, leadership, uh, you know, um, the, the, the self-discipline. And then, of course, they walk away four years later with the 9-11 GI Bill. And that can help on the financial side. So we've already seen that they we're right there to catch them and to help them through that process and offer them an opportunity. And, and we're also there for OCS at the end of school when they graduate. So either way, <clears throat> but it, it, we've also we've seen an uplift. And John Evans has been a phenomenal partner in this process, and it's really it's helping us. Yeah, no, uh, Ted, to both you and uh, Frank Fritz, that uh, Sergeant Major, this next one's uh, uh, down to you on the talking about modernizing accessions, but after we uh, get them into our ranks, a uh, real quick question on how is the 22-week IET training pilot you know, progressing? Kind of what's your, what's your thoughts on that? What do you see in, in any plans for future uh, military occupational specialty adjustments beyond the infantry IET? Any uh, thoughts? Yes, sir, thanks. Um, so we, we have concluded uh, with the uh, first two companies of infantry OSET down at Fort Benning going through the expanded uh, OSET, uh, which increased it to 22 weeks. Uh, and first of all, with the, with the increase in time, um, one of uh, my boss's uh, stipulations, General Townsend's, was that uh, with that extra time, you're really not introducing uh, more than, anything more than 50% of that allotted time. So. Uh, with with that uh, other time, it, it all came down to increased repetition and uh, more focus on uh, just being a better soldier with the fundamentals. Um, and and so far, what we have seen from that, and even though it's only been two infantry companies, uh, in which we've already started with the next go around of it, um, we we saw increased uh, averages of the Army physical fitness test at the end of cycle. We saw increased averages of those soldiers uh, achieving uh, expert in their rifle marksmanship. Uh, we increased uh, at the right times, not just to put a whole bunch of extra miles on them, but we increased the mileage uh, that they do under load with foot marches. Uh, and we did that not just with OSUP, but we did it also with uh, straight basic training when it came to their culminating exercise. I and mean, again, uh, some, somebody might think that that's uh, counterproductive um, uh, when we're talking about holistic health fitness and keeping them fit and less injuries and all that. Um, but I'll tell you that when it's introduced at the right time uh, and, the, and, and the right place in the right manner, meaning the, the right amount of weight, they're wearing equipment correctly, not saying that they aren't, but just ensuring that we have the focus of that, um, that increased weight uh, adds uh, a lot more rigor uh, to them and gives them a, a, a better overall experience and better, a better chance for fitting into their first uh, uh, unit of assignment, operational units. Uh, so with the 22-week OSUT, we saw, uh, for the most part, we saw all, everything pretty positive. We're gonna, we plan on continuing to do that. Uh, we have the other OSUTs that uh, we are starting to plan for in uh, implementing, uh, and it won't necessarily be 22 weeks, but it's going to be uh, something that increases the length of the current OSUTs, whether it be uh, by two weeks, three weeks, or whatever deemed necessary. But the next one to go into, uh, into uh, trial will be uh, in uh, armor OSUT. Uh, and then from there, we'll move to uh, the engineer OSUT, and then uh, we'll consider what we're going to do with uh, the uh, artillery guys uh, out at Fort Sill. Um, but overall, the, the increase with, with that has been uh, overwhelming positive. Yeah, actually, before we move on, yeah. you know, it's, Great. Uh, the, uh, in addition to OSA, the basic combat training has undergone a revolutionary change. Uh, Major General Malcolm Frost and uh, Sergeant Major uh, Ed Mitchell uh, leading the effort to harden basic combat training 
And uh, if you ever get an opportunity, I think Sergeant Major will nod on this one, if you ever get an opportunity to go to Fort Jackson and watch a basic training battalion graduate and to see them on the last day of their major training exercise, it's a, uh, as they uh, are patched and brought on as uh, true Army soldiers, it's just a phenomenal experience. And I, I think it's safe to say that we are creating the soldiers today that are going to be ready to come out of the ramp off the ramp of the next generation combat vehicle when it's fielded, you know, a couple of years down the road. It's exciting. Yeah, no, hey, Ted, thanks for, thanks for that. Mr. Secretary, the next question kind of goes to, to you. We talked earlier about a lot of different uh, marketing strategies, a uh, little bit on the policy side, but all the things, uh, now, Frank, that you and your team are doing, not only across the technologies, but how would you recommend we change and what have you seen to modify or adjust our marketing efforts to better support the broader uh, Army mission going forward? Um, well, I mentioned, I think, that we're at about the third pivotal point in Army, the, all, the recruiting for the all-volunteer Army. Uh, I think this is a great juncture to take a very um, open-minded review of, of our strategy. Uh, the Army and marketing faces a big trade-off between the near and far uh, piece of the effort. Uh, near would be the work we're doing sort of this year for this year, or maybe the work this year for next year. Um, but of course the Army is an ongoing entity, it's not going out of business, so we need to think deep. Uh, what about those kids that will be rising to be 17 year olds five years from now? Uh, I, was a high school, I was a school superintendent, uh, I was also a parent. I know when kids start thinking about what they're going to do with their life and who they begin doing that thinking with. Uh, given the nature of families in our country, very often it's mom, uh, and very often it's uh, about 12 or 13 years old. If we're not in the set of things that folks are thinking about uh, doing with their life when they're 12 or 13, it's going to be tough to get in there when they're 17. Uh, we'll get in there because other things didn't work out. Uh, certainly Army is a great uh, organization for folks who are looking for that next set of choices, uh, but we want to be an employer of choice. We want kids to be uh, looking at us among the first set of things they'd like to do with their life. We know for military kids, those who know us best, uh, we are uh, very often that employer of choice. We are very strong with kids who have had exposure to the military uh, and, and as children. So I think that's a key choice, uh, near, far, and how to allocate resources to do that and what messaging to uh, provide to do that and what venue to do it. Uh, I think Frank's uh, work with uh, game technology positions us very well uh, to think through that. Um, we've got a key brand. Uh, you've seen it, it's the Army Star and it's the U.S. Army. We have amazing sub-brands as well. The choice about how to bring those to the fore and what venue to do that. Uh, General Muth is doing great work in all kinds of media that are sort of below the radar uh, that you see on you know, the TV, the main TV channels, but probably are more important because that's where a lot of the young folks are and uh, you can really target folks very well there with different messages. So um, our master brand is terrific, but a lot of folks talk about it too. Um, our sub-brands, they have very little to say about it uh, and those sub-brands bring great strength and you could think about them from aviation across the board uh, to high-tech fields in medicine and things the Army's doing there. So I think those are key choices the Army's going to want to look at. Uh, and then you've got the component discussion, which I mentioned before. How would you like to serve? Uh, active, uh, migrate maybe to uh, guard or reserve, or even finally um, the civilian side of the Army. And then of course there's the officer uh, enlisted dichotomy. So the spread, the messaging, what tools to use, uh, we're at a key juncture to think that through. And we're in a very good place to help uh, to do that, given the alignment of the, uh, the leadership of the Army, uh, the resources that are in place. And the fact we're going to be coming out of this year, I think, in a very strong position. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks. I want to stick uh, somewhat with you, but uh, General Martin, to, to you as well. And it has to do with uh, the topic of what we're about this afternoon. We've talked vast majority about the active component. But our uh, uh, reserve component teammates with uh, General Chip Lucky and certainly Tim Cadavery, Cadavy and in in our guard uh, teammates, the, the role and the challenges that our uh, COMPO two and three formations have is just unique. It's different. It's challenging, either by state, either it's a Title 32 or Title 10 for our reserve components. 
But part of that also is our recruiters that kind of see themselves is in a very competitive atmosphere. So how do we, how do we change that going forward and how do we help them uh, meet their numbers as well? And we talked, I think Frank, you mentioned earlier, 68K is the recruiting number for this year, active component. So what about our other uh, teammates and what are we doing uh, for them as well and how do we assist? Frank, we'll start uh, with you. Oh, okay. I, I thought, all right. Um, so, uh, you know, I have, you know, have visibility and we have actually reserve recruiters as part of our formation. So AGR recruiters are 79 Romeos. So uh, they're, you know, we're all together in this. Uh, but what we don't work with is the National Guard. Now, we do have some test, pilot test programs based on the, uh, the, uh, the National Commission on the Future of the Army. Uh, and it was uh, finding number 38, which said, let's do a, t a pilot on bringing some recruiting um, stations together, which would allow cross-component compo recruiting. That test is still ongoing. Uh, I, I, I will tell you that when you talk to the recruiters, uh, there, there is a bit of a competition out there, but we, now, so I have to constantly message to them that it's not a competition. We're all in this together. It is one army. And if anything came out of that National Commission on the Future of the Army, it was the fact that we are all in this together, compo one, two, or three. And so I do have to correct them uh, on, a, on a, a bit of a basis just because they feel that sometimes what states can offer, we can't offer. And um, that's just, but that is the way it is. And uh, so uh, I'm, it is a, not an uphill battle, but it is a, a, a continuous stream of, you know, the fact that we're one team, one fight. Yeah. And that's all they get from us. So, uh, you know, it takes a, it takes a lot to turn that uh, 10,000 recruiter force across 1,400 locations, but we're heading in the right direction, I think. Yeah, I, I'd absolutely Please, say, uh, interestingly enough, I was in two recruiting stations uh, yesterday. And uh, I can't tell the difference between a, a, guard, uh, a reserve uh, recruiter. In fact, I stumble upon them. Uh, and then I always ask the same question Frank does, is how do we share? You know, uh, you don't walk in and say, hey, do you want reserves or do you want active duty? It's a, it's a discovery process as they learn about the military. And, uh, my, you know, my uh, interaction with recruiters is much less than Frank's. But I haven't seen an in, uh, instance yet where there wasn't pretty good teamwork down at the uh, recruiting station. And if you've never been to a recruiting station, they're very interesting. Uh, it's, it's like a squad. Uh, it's all non-commissioned officers. Uh, they're making things happen at the lowest level. You know, when I gave my introduction, I told you it, it's an exciting time. Uh, it's also high adventure. And I, I'm really proud of our recruiting force. They're just doing awesome things. And, and I didn't see any real friction down there. Yeah, good. I'd say the, on, the one challenge we probably need to address for the Guard and Reserve is the employer support to Guard and Reserve. Uh, we've come out of a, a war nobody envisioned of length that the, the volunteer force would go through. Um, I was in the office of the ASA uh, five days after 9-11, and there were people in there talking about a draft. Uh, happily, none of that ever came to pass, but it did put, this war did put a great deal of stress on employers of Guard and Reserve because they held positions open for a long time while folks served their country, often providing an offset to the income lost and so forth. Um, it's going to be, it's high time to go back and revisit with employers and, and make sure we have a good understanding of our expectations and theirs of how a person in this country can be employed uh, and yet continue to serve as well and how we strike that balance. And so those discussions with the Guard Bureau our reserve uh, contemporaries are going to be very important uh, because I think we're coming out of that phase and as the National Military Strategy talks about, going into a whole new phase where those folks are going to be vital uh, to our national security. Yeah, Brigadier, I'm going to uh, toss one down to uh, your end of the table there, uh, David. A great question from the audience of the success of uh, the program uh, in the UK, but more specifically, how successful is the program to recruit non-residents um, uh, of the UK into the armed forces? And I believe there was a, uh, a period of time where the Commonwealth uh, uh, stopped or delayed uh, recruiting for some time. And if you could address that, sir. Certainly, uh, we've um, recruited from the Commonwealth countries uh, for, for many decades on and off. Um, 
sometimes controlled politically, sometimes from, from a military perspective. Um, until the beginning of November last year, we were um, capped for the whole of defense at 200 from the Commonwealth um, uh, nations who had to have a, a minimum residency period in the UK of five years or more. So we'd effectively turned the tap off. There was a lot of pressure from all three services through the Ministry of Defense to the Home Office uh, who control immigration and the Foreign Office that issue visas and the like that we wanted to open this back up again. It was an expedient to some extent to, to get numbers uh, increased, but also recognize that there's a lot of talent in our Commonwealth uh, countries uh, or the Commonwealth countries that, that we should be drawing on. Um, and it was a long battle. I think it lasted 18 months or more. And eventually it was signed off at the ministerial level and we got the authority to start recruiting again from uh, the beginning of November. Our financial years are up six months offset from yours, so ours is about to end at the end of March. And we had authority for the army to recruit 470, nearly 480, uh, up to the start of uh, the next financial year, so over a four-month period. Um, it has gone, I would say, um, much worse than we had hoped it would. Um, I think in part because we were trying to force it to work really quickly. 400 uh, people from overseas that have got to go through a visa application process, they've got to go through a selection process when we get in here, the, the whole application process is, is, is something that takes a bit of time. Um, and we know that there is a massive demand out there. So we've only got to turn the tap on and we can get, we can get swamped if we're not careful by too many applications that we find difficult to process. So it's a really difficult balancing act to get the flow rate right to meet, to meet our demand. Um, I think we've, in a very short period of time, we've learned a lot of lessons, and we've got about 10, 12, 13% of this year's annual allocation, I, the next one year about to start. We could fill from the Commonwealth ranks, and I think we need, we need to do that um, just to make sure that we, that we hit our target for the end of this year. But we are going to continue to do it, and I think until such time as something changes politically or we get to a point where UK national recruiting supply allows us to dial down that, yeah. that uh, rear stat, then I think we're going to continue to, to, to recruit from the Commonwealth for, for a number, number of years yet. No, no, David, uh, thanks. Um, a a sort of major, you, you touched on this earlier, and, and uh, Frank, you highlighted this as well about uh, what we're doing across our nation and what are the influencers, if you will, who else besides just our recruiters? This is a, a national issue that everybody needs to address. So the question is, how, uh, how important are the parents, coaches, clergy to our recruiting efforts, uh, what they're uh, doing, and how to uh, leverage that uh, that segment as well for the uh, future force. Sergeant Major, start with any, any thoughts there. Yes, sir. Uh, I got a couple of brief thoughts on that because uh, it kind of goes to uh, the importance of the parents or parents in this, uh, in this whole piece. And uh, I guess what you don't understand until you kind of sit back and look at it, and this is anything that I'm talking about is stuff that I've already learned from, from General Muth and, and his team at USAREC. But, um, you know, when, when, you, when you talk about the parents and their ability to influence, one of the things that really uh, kind of struck me and, and was something that I highlighted was the, the time, additional time, if you will, that uh, young, young adults hang around the house. Um, you know, it's a little bit different than when I grew up, uh, not that I was forced out or anything, but it was highly encouraged. Um, that I'm going to find something to do. Um, and, and I can even attest to it in my own personal experience. Uh, I, I have a 21-year-old that's uh, finishing up school and hanging out in the house yet. So, you know, the ability for parents to continue to influence uh, for or against uh, what we're talking about uh, does have a great impact on the way that those those uh, young citizens, young adults, look at uh, service to the nation. Um, and then, you know, on top of it, with, uh, with our uh, unemployment rate being at record lows, and uh, I would say that the other, the other thing, you know, probably uh, not necessarily 
a person influencer, but uh, kind of the idea and the thought that uh, um, after you graduate from high school, you have to go to school. Uh, you have to go to college. It's, it's almost, uh, I mean, my oldest son even told me that he's going to, you know, what, which he already did graduate and got his, his bachelor's degree. He said, he said, I'm going to go straight into my master's uh, degree program. And I was like, good golly, you didn't even, uh, you know, start anything yet. Uh, but uh, I think that that's, a, that's part of it also is that, uh, you know, a lot of young people kind of, that's, that's kind of the, the career path, if you will, that's kind of set up for a lot of them. And until they have uh, a, a prominent influence uh, that suggests uh, service, military service, service in the Army, um, it's a, lot of, a lot of times it's not anything that they, they kind of thought about until, as General Muth kind of alluded to, you know, there, we have recruiters that are standing outside of some of those areas at the college when, uh, when either, you know, the grades or the money or whatever doesn't take complete root like it's meant to be, and uh, they're kind of wondering what's going to be the next step. Um, but yes, uh, you know, and, and the other thing that goes back to the marketing piece is that uh, we didn't specifically do this on, from the Army perspective, but uh, DOD did it, and I'm sure that some of you have seen it, but there were commercials that, uh, uh, that were produced that specifically hit uh, the parent as the influencer, and I think that those are uh, huge as far as making some money on and progress as to where we need to go uh, with with uh, what our recruiters are doing. Uh, and I've talked to some of the recruiters, you know, and a lot of even even though you know there's a lot of uh, individual uh, efforts from a, a recruiter that's out there. Uh, a lot of times, I've been told from their experiences that. Uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, it, it's kind of like twofold. Uh, there's a there's a recruiter that's talking to that possible applicant, uh, and at the same time, there's a recruiter, uh, maybe at the same location, that's talking to those parents, uh, those influencers. Uh, I can think back many years ago when when I w was uh, um, when I wanted to join, and uh, uh, I don't remember specifically two recruiters being at the house, but I do remember that uh, one time my the recruiter came to the house and I thought he was coming to see me and he said, no, I'm here to talk to your parents. Um, I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and I, I, quite, I didn't quite expect that, but that's the way it happened. And I, and, uh, I think that that is a huge thing that uh, we have to pay attention to. Uh, and if you ever saw any of those commercials, they're, they're kind of cool. The, uh, the Army one uh, shows a, uh, uh, a soldier, uh, or, or appears to be a soldier uh, in his ghillie suit uh, doing, doing some stalking. And uh, mom is in her pajamas following him through the uh, mist and the darkness of the night. And he's talking to mom as he's trying to complete this sniper mission. Um, and then it goes back to, you know, real time where he's in his bedroom uh, playing virtual games or something like that, and he just asks for mom's support. So there's a lot that, uh, that we can do to... Uh, to pay attention to the parents and the coaches because uh, they do have a very big part in uh, developing uh, our young people for today. And I'll pass it off to General Muth if he's got anything to add. Thanks. I, just to, I know we're getting close to time, but um, so we talked in the beginning. Uh, the numbers I gave you, that's the, there's two, arts, two parts to recruiting. There's science and there's art. The numbers I gave you, that's the science. That, that, that just doesn't change. Those numbers are, there's just been proven since 1974. What's changed is the art. And we're talking about technology. That is the art that has now changed. But some things do not change in art. And that has to deal with how we recruit by talking to the influencers. And so what we don't realize, although we plan these big events uh, all over the Army now through the Fusion Cell, which is, has helped immensely, uh, every day, 10,000 recruiters, 1,400 locations, there's hundreds of small events that are still taking place. And those are focused on those influencers. And it's talking to the guidance counselors, the principals, the superintendents, the coaches, the moms, the dads, the sisters, the aunts. And I, we go out of our way to make sure that we have a, a collective message, one, two, that we sit down and we, we relate to them. Because they will, at the end of the day, go back and influence and, and potentially change the path that the, the individual applicant wants to take. And so we make sure that we involve them in the conversation very early and also, and it's not just in the home. The schools and the, and the playing fields are, uh, they are just extremely important to make sure that we get that message across. Thank you.
Can I just echo yeah, that? Yeah, I, David, I, please, I agree with ahead. everything I've just heard. I think uh, parents are obviously really important, but uh, I don't know whether the questioner was focusing on that for a specific reason, but it's all the other influences that are massively important uh, too. I was at a, a major national event in the UK about uh, two weeks ago, uh, a STEM-driven event, 80,000 school children from the sort of age of 18 uh, down to 13 go through it over four days. Um, and the, the forces are there, but the British Army had a really strong presence. It's about talking to children about influencing where they want to go in their careers in a STEM environment. But for us, it's just as important to be able to talk to the teachers who can then influence their uh, students and allow us to go to schools to talk about STEM being an important issue in itself, but also develop opportunities for them in a, in a STEM environment in defense. So if I could, uh, last week I spent two hours with the superintendent of, the New, of New Jersey's uh, school association, oversees all the schools, and we spent two hours. He is all in about uh, helping us talk about both, you know, what the future or what the Army can provide uh, as a future for anybody uh, that is within the school system, uh, with the students, but also to talk with the families, and they have a program going on in New Jersey, very unique, we're gonna try to get it to the other states, where they run a STEM competition that the Army promotes. And so it's not just the competition uh, from the seniors of, a high, of high schools, it goes all the way down to uh, elementary school. And uh, you know, they, last year they had uh, about uh, 90,000 applicants, and down to, and it got down to, or applications, and it got down to about 9,000, and then the, the, the top 90 went to the final competition. And it's all focused on trying to solve world problems through science, technology, engineering, and math. And so, great opportunity, and we will continue to try to keep pushing that through the rest of the states. Yeah, no, Frank, thanks. I, you know, I was uh, counseled by uh, General Ham before we started here, say, listen, Mick, said, you will start on time and we will end on time. There's a heck of a lot of other things on the agenda here at this uh, great symposium, but I'd be remiss if I didn't provide our uh, senior panel member, the secretary. Uh, sir, over to you for any potential uh, comments that you'd have, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I'd like to point out just uh, some obvious things. Uh, the folks up here on the dais are committed um, to their services, uh, a British colleague uh, and the U.S. Army of folks here. Uh, I think we believe strongly that the U.S. Army is a great opportunity for young Americans. It's becoming a stronger and stronger opportunity for young American women. Uh, we now have women in all of our formations. Um, we now have fitness tests designed to accommodate uh, all genders um, and put people in the right piece of the Army to succeed. Uh, our talent management efforts are focused on taking the very best of what America sends us and putting it to work where it can do its best work for its country, um, putting people in the sweet spot where they can do um, their very best for us and ultimately for themselves. Uh, as we look across the United States, uh, I had an opportunity to meet with governors a, a short while ago, and they were asking what can we do to get the next future command in our state and so forth. And I said, well, uh, last time I checked, you're the chief education officer of your state. You own the universities and you own pre-K to 12th grade. Uh, the Army is your natural partner. Uh, when folks come to us, uh, they leave us better for it. Uh, they leave career ready. Uh, they leave mature. Most cases, they leave with a security clearance, or can. Uh, they leave with great experiences about coming to work on time and doing the job that they've been hired to do, the soft skills that all employers talk about. Uh, importantly, they also come back to their states with the GI Bill. Uh, depending on the state, that can be worth up to $300,000 in federal benefits coming into a state, coming into the state colleges, workforce readiness programs, uh, and then becoming workforce readiness. Um, if a state wants something like a futures command, it's going to hinge uh, very significantly on workforce readiness and what workforce can be brought to bear to meet the needs of this employer or any employer. I can't think of a better resource than the GI Bill to bring great Americans back to their home state or to a new state, get them to settle, go to uh, school, uh, get the housing allowance that goes with it, establish a household, and stay there and be part of that state's economic future. Uh, the Army is a terrific way to begin uh, life, and it's a terrific way for our states to further 
uh, their workforce readiness and their economic viability. And I'm a terrific believer in the U.S. Army and the opportunities it provides, and I know these gentlemen are as well. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks. And as uh, Joe Hamm makes his uh, way up here, sir, I, I failed in my mission. I've got about 18 questions that I did not get to, but all uh, excellent. And I really appreciate uh, everybody's diligence in staying with us for the panel. And, uh, sir, thanks for allowing us the opportunity. Well, thanks, Joe Bednarik and the panel. Thanks. How about a round of applause, please? I think this panel is particularly important. You know, we talk a lot in the Army about modernization, but if you have exactly the right organization, if you've got the most modern equipment, if you've got the right operational concept, it doesn't matter if you don't have the right people. And that, that, that today's panel has reminded us of that. As Dr. Wardinsky said at the very start, this, is, this panel uh, is a precursor of, I think, what we can see as a significant area of emphasis from the senior Army leadership for the remainder of this year and continuing on uh, deep into the future, an, uh, an extensive uh, study and, and conversation about what's the right talent management processes and, and, and policies for the United States Army uh, moving forward. So thank you all very, very much. I was very pleased to, to hear General Muth talk a little bit about the National Commission on the Future of the Army. I bear a little scar tissue uh, from, from that endeavor, but it reminded me, General Muth, of uh, what I believe is the the single most important part of, the, of that uh, commission's report. And it says simply, the nation has one army for sound reasons, historical, legal, cultural, operational, and strategic. The army has three distinct interdependent and essential components, the regular army, army national guard, and army reserve. And it is only when each of those components is properly sized, manned, trained, and equipped that the nation's one army can accomplish the many diverse missions the nation requires. Thank you for, for reminding us of, of that, uh, General Muth, and thanks each of you for, for contributing uh, to that. I was also reminded, as General Muth talked about, you know, the, the, the youngsters don't know, you know, can I have a car, can I have a dog? Uh, General Muth will, has seen this, but there's a, there's a wonderful army commercial uh, in, in the early 1970s, I think 74, maybe 75, shortly after the uh, end of the draft and the beginning of the all-volunteer force. There's a very, very young John Travolta uh, in an Army recruiting ad, and that very young John Travolta buys this hot Camaro, and that's the message, right? Join the Army and buy a hot car and, and, uh, and, I, and maybe learn how to dance. I'm not sure exactly what, what the John Travolta linkage was, uh, was there, but we're very, very thankful for you. Um, this concludes our, our, our activities for today, except for the, the exhibits are still open in East Hall, outside in the South Hall, and our opening reception uh, will begin at, at uh, 5 o'clock, 1700, until 1800 this afternoon. Uh, the reception uh, very generously sponsored by BAE Systems, so we look forward to seeing you in South Hall for the reception. Brigadier, one last point. Uh, as you, you had a great conversation about uh, how the British Army is, is undertaking its mission, belong to something that matters. Belong to something that matters. Um, I would say belong to your association of the United States Army <laughs> and, and go see Christine Lathrop out there by the registration desk and become a member. Thank you all very, very much for a great afternoon. Thanks, John. It was a pleasure.